Yeshua. Jesus. King Jesus. Our Lord, our Savior. Glorious King. We worship you. Jesus, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And yours is the glory forever and ever. All glory to you, God. Father, I pray that you would help us to get our eyes off of ourselves, get our eyes off of our problems, and fix our eyes upon you. You are the author and the perfecter of our faith. God, refocus us on Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Jesus, yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power. All to you. Only King Jesus has the power to break chains. Only King Jesus has the power to bring freedom, to bring healing, to bring, to bring hope, to bring deliverance, to bring provision for where you need it. Only King Jesus can do that for you. God, let our hearts draw near to you. You're our God. You're our King. Father, we worship you. And God, as we come into a new year, let our hearts be set on you. Let our vision be renewed. Let our strength be renewed. God, I just ask, Lord, that this this year would be the year that the church would rise up. Not just Grace Church here in Twin Falls, but God, the church in America would rise up. Your bride would rise up throughout the nations, God. We would see the miracles. We would see the wonders of your majesty throughout all of the earth, God. The people would be set free and they wouldn't be able to deny it, Lord, that your works would go forth and break the chains. Free people, God. Let us be a part of that, God. Let us no longer sit stagnant, but God, let us be an active, involved church, involved in our community, involved in our families. Lord, let us go forth for your purpose, God. No longer distracted by the things of this earth, but our vision and our focus set upon you for this new year, God. Have your way in your church. Have your way in this church, God. New vision new focus set upon the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You and you alone, God. That we no longer question and think, is that God? But God, that our relationship with you would be so close and so connected that we would know, that we would walk in your will, that we would no longer second guess but go, this is God and I'm going to follow your call. Build your church up. We don't want to be ineffective anymore. We want to be your hands and feet. We want to be the, the, your hope to the lost, God. We want to be a, an extension of what your Holy Spirit's doing. So God, we pray for this new year, not just for resolutions to lose weight or to, to do this or to do that or to set new habits or to set new goals, but God, let this be a year where we press in and we have vision and focus on you and you alone, God. Change and transform us radically, God. Let this be a year of drastic change from the youngest to the oldest, God. You're not done with us yet. Until you call us home, you're not done with us. So God, let us have that purpose in our hearts for this new year, God. Thank you for who you are. You can use even the simple things. You can use even me. You can use even, even us, God, to do your will, to have your way, to bring revival, to bring hope, to bring freedom. Praise your name for who you are. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, God. Amen. Before you're seated, I want you to greet somebody that you didn't come to church with. And if you're watching online, I want you to run across the street and greet one of your neighbors. Amen? Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. God is good all the time. Amen. Amen. If you're here with us at Grace Church for the first time or the first time in a while, we're happy that you came to worship with us today. We want to say bless you. And uh, if you want a free meal or a free coffee off of us, we got you covered. So if you'd like to fill out the, uh, the visitor cards, uh, just put your name and number there, and we will treat you to lunch, treat you to dinner, treat you to coffee, and uh, answer any questions you might have, pray with you, and let you know what our church is about. And we're happy you came to visit with us today. Amen? Amen. 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 Does anybody here know what an elf's favorite type of music is? Rap. 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 Eric. Um, no. Okay. Dang it. That was my one last chance for a Christmas pun joke, so that's it. Speaking of rap, we're going to wrap up the new year. Great this evening. We've got a great church service tonight. If you want to join us tonight, we've got our Sunday evening service. That's, uh, if you want to put that up there, Stevie. That's tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, so the, the service itself starts at 8 p.m. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some games, time of fellowship, and then we're going to transi transition around 10, 1030, start moving in uh, worship and prayer to bring in the new year. And we're going to pray up until midnight and uh, bring in the new year right. I believe that the way you finish something is how you start a new something. And so we're going to finish this new year strong. Amen? Amen. 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 And we're going to see God move here in 2024. So join us tonight starting at 8 p.m. And if you can't join us starting then, if you can come anytime in between then, feel free to. If you have to leave early, that's okay too. But we'll, we'll be blessed to have you. And then also, we have our Fast Monday coming up tomorrow. So at, at midnight, we're going to slap the food out of your hand until you can't have any more. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Fast Monday. So this Monday we'll be fasting as a church. We're looking forward to that. Uh, and that's really, when we look in the Bible, seeing fasting and how that works, the, the, the power behind it, I think if the American church can tap into fasting and making that a regular occurrence, not just once a month like we do here at the church, but making it a regular uh, uh, habitual thing that we do, I, I think we'll see the power of God move. So we're looking forward to that. That's, that's something where we're going to lift up the needs of the church and the valley. And Pastor will have us on the, on the uh, Church Center app. So if you have the Church Center app, he's going to have uh, vision for us, ways that we can pray, an encouraging video. So look that up on Fast Monday as you fast. Amen? Amen. Also, we have our Outreach Wednesdays. Uh, that's coming up this Wednesday evening at 630, and we look forward to that. That's where we get out into the community, go preach the gospel, get uncomfortable for Jesus, and uh, tell somebody how much Jesus loves them. And so I loved it because we went out last week. You know, we didn't have an amazing, powerful testimony, but we went out and we talked to people around the neighborhood. We talked to people at Fred Meyer, and I was a little discouraged because I was like, oh, man, I, you know, we didn't pray for deliverance for anybody, but... Uh, I love what Brother Terry said. He looked over and he goes, that's why they call it fishing. So, amen? Go fishers of men. Let's, sometimes you get a bite, sometimes you don't. But we're, we're called to go, so let's be faithful to go. And we look forward to Outreach Wednesday tonight. So if you can join us for Outreach, if you're still a little uncomfortable with Outreach, that's okay. If you want to come and pray, we need prayer behind us when we go out to preach the gospel because... Hey, yeah, oh, you get up in front of people. I still get nervous talking to strangers when it comes to preaching the gospel. It's uncomfortable, but it's what we're called to do as Christians. Amen? Amen. Also, uh, Wednesday morning, we have men's prayer. That's at 7 a.m. Men, I, I apologize. I was a little under the weather, but uh, Tor helped us out there. So, And unfortunately, Jim Bob's Bakery is closed after a holiday. So there weren't any donuts for you gentlemen, so I apologize. I can't promise there will be donuts because it'll be new. It'll be the day after New Year, so I don't. I don't know. I don't know if they'll be closed or not. But hopefully they'll be open. Hopefully we'll have donuts. But we will have prayer. So if you came for donuts, I might take you out to donuts afterward. So, anyway, men of men of prayer, 7 a.m. We love pressing in and praying for this church and praying for this valley. Amen. Amen. Also, a quick reminder, men. We have our men's retreat coming up, February 16th through 18th. There. If you have any questions on that connect with Brother Lyle, myself, or Pastor. Uh, the cost is 205 early sign up, so we want to give you advance warning because uh, th there's you know a lot of bills and stuff coming up, so we just want to make sure you have time to prepare for that 
and to be ready. And we look forward to what God does when, when men of God press in with one another, gathering to seek his face. And uh, hopefully you'll have some husbands and uh, men come back, some sons come back with new, refreshed vision and purpose. Amen? Amen. And a quick note as well, we've got our social medias. Uh, we just got everything fixed on the audio, hopefully, for our YouTube channel. So if you're watching live on YouTube, hopefully all the audio issues are fixed. Uh, we're so thankful for you. We will have live chat at some point, but we don't really have the capability to get the live chat right now. So uh, if you want to leave us a comment afterward, we will definitely respond to that. But the live chat, we're kind of dragging behind on that. So apologies for that. But uh, if you want to join us on YouTube, Facebook, or Rumble, we'll have our links there as well. Amen? Amen. All right. And with that, we'll invite the ushers to come forward for the giving of our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. God, we thank you. God, you're such an abundant provider. God, you step up in times when we don't expect. God, you are faithful and true to your word. God, you continue to amaze and awe us by your splendor, by your majesty, by, by your provision, by your abundance. And God, even though things can be rough at times, Lord, we thank you that you're faithful. And Lord, we give back in honor to you in thankfulness to you, God, because you've always come through for us, and you will never fail us, because it's not in your nature to fail. You will always provide for your children. So, Lord, we give out of a heart of gratitude, saying thank you, Lord, for all you've brought us through in Jesus' mighty name. And, Lord, we just ask for your anointing to rest with Pastor Jacob as he comes to preach your word this morning. Lord, let our hearts be molded and changed by your Holy Spirit. Let our, let our hearts receive your word today, God. Let us be new creatures in Christ today from when we walked in this building, Lord, that we would be changed today to never be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And kids, you're dismissed for Children's Church. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, happy almost New Year. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you. And I hope everybody had an amazing Christmas holiday, that you were able to spend some time reflecting on the goodness of God, and, and hopefully you weren't consumed with, with gifts and presents, but honoring the birth and the fruition of God's plan for salvation and redemption back to us. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Hope you're able to do that. If you weren't, no condemnation, no criticism, but do better. <laughs> do better. Amen? No, no. I know last week we finished up our, our series um, going over Road to Christmas, and it was a good, it was a good road, I thought. Looking back at the names spoken over Jesus that, that Isaiah spoke over the Messiah two, over two, or 700 years ago, excuse me, 700 years before the Christ of birth, or the birth's Christ. Wow! Christ's birth. Amen? Amen. And we looked specifically at those names spoken over Jesus in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, 14. And I love that Isaiah wasn't only speaking the names of the Messiah, right? Isaiah was actually speaking into the very character, into the very personality, into the very actions of what the Messiah would be and who he would be on earth. But not only stopping at his death, resurrection, or at his birth, at his death, and his resurrection, right? Those names didn't just stop at his resurrection. Those names are a continuation of who he is even to this day for us with us and in us, right? So when we're talking about those names, the Prince of Peace, when we're talking about him being our Prince of Peace, he still is our peace. Amen? When we're talking about him as our wonderful counselor, he is still the wonderful counselor. When we're talking about him as mighty God, he is still mighty God, everlasting, eternal Father. That is who he is. And then last week we talked about Emmanuel, how he is God with us. Never has left us, never will leave us. He is God with us. And I love that he didn't stop being those things, but rather he is still continually those things for us. But today, I want to look back at the past year. So today we're going to be talking about a year in review. A year in review. And when we're talking specifically about Grace Church, there's a lot that happened this past year, right? Right? When we're looking back at this year, there is a ton of stuff that happened this year. And I, I marked some, some highlights down 
uh, from this past year that we went over. So we started off the year talking about how this year will be a year of repentance. And repentance was the foundation word of this year. That we're repenting of the things, focusing and bringing our focus back on who Jesus Christ is, right? We initiated a monthly church fast and planned on making fasting part of our walk with Christ. No longer something that is special, no longer something that we, we hold in high esteem, but something that is actually part of our walk with Christ, right? Because it's a commandment in our walk with Christ. Jesus said, when you fast. He didn't say, when, I, when, when you think you should fast for a situation. He said, no, when you fast, meaning it's part of our walk and relationship with Jesus. We initiated that, and we will be moving to a two-day fast. Not, 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 not tomorrow, <laughs> right? But in February, we are going to start our two-day fast. We're going to increase from one day to two days. Okay, and hopefully by the end of the year, we're going to be up to three days a month of where we're fasting. Now, some of you are already fasting three days a month, and that's fantastic. But as a church, that is the goal for the end of the year. And in April, Angie and I went to a pastor's conference at Hungry Gen Church in Pasco, Washington, where we received confirmation to bring forth the deliverance ministry into the forefront of what Grace Church is and who we will be known as. And then in June... June happened, and our building got flooded. And I still to this day praise the fact that, that God brought Elder Joseph in on that Thursday morning because we weren't going to be in until sa Saturday. So I praise God that, Joseph, you came in, brother, because he saved us a lot more damage than what it would have been. Amen? Amen? So we got our flood, pushed us out in the community, pushed us into the parks, where we experienced something different and new, where we started praying for people just out of the blue walking up to us after our church services. We prayed for five people who just randomly came over who desperately needed prayer, and we were an answer to their prayer that morning. There was one gentleman I remember said, my girlfriend just committed suicide and I don't know what to do. And we were able to pray with him. And he was able to experience peace for the first time in a couple of months. Amen? And at that point, we also started our Outreach Wednesdays, which followed up our fast Mondays. In July, we started full-fledged deliverance ministry, talking about freedom in the body of Christ. And since that point, we have seen over 50 people delivered from things that they had experienced that they needed freedom in. Amen. Amen? Over 50 people experienced freedom in their life from struggles that they struggled their whole entire life, thinking they're never going to get freedom from. They found freedom. Amen? That was an amazing point. And in August, we returned here only to realize how much we truly appreciated this building. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We had multiple spontaneous baptisms throughout the year. And I loved it that, that it culminated into two weeks ago where we had Brother Francis, our brother from Ghana, brought a powerful word about repentance. Closing up what God had started back in January that same year. And I love how God works. And it's good to look back at things like this. But this morning, I don't want to spend the time looking back at a year of review of Grace Church. I'm not talking about the church this morning. This morning, I want to talk about ourselves. And I love what, what Paul wrote. After 31 years of ministry, he wrote a letter to his protege, Timothy. And in this letter, he says something to Timothy that really sparked something within him, and also it should spark something within us as well. And it's found in 1 Timothy 4, 16. And Paul is writing to Timothy, and as we understand the letters of Paul, 1 and 2 Timothy were the last two letters that he wrote. These were the last letters he wrote while he was in prison before he gave himself up to death. These are the last letters he wrote, and he was reaching out, crying out to Timothy, and this is what he says in verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. It says, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvations of those who hear you. But keep a close watch. Keep a close watch on how you live. Examine your life. Look at your life. Watch your life closely. Review your life. Perform a checkup on yourself to see how it is that you're doing, right? But consider your life. 
how you're growing, what you're learning, and how God is blessing you. And it harkens back to what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. And this is what he says in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. He says, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Now that can either be a blessing verse or a condemnation verse, right? Depending on how it is that you're walking and how it is that you're living. See, God is, if, if God is searching my heart and if God is examining my mind, should we not also be doing the same thing? If God is doing it, we should be doing it also, right? So this morning, we're going to be talking about how we should review our own personal year. How we should look back on 2023 and how we lived, how we walked, what we did. Amen? So the first thing that I want you to do in, as you do this review is I want you to count your blessings. I want you to count your blessings. It's so easy to look back on the past year, to look on the entirety of those 365 days. It's so easy to look back on that and only see the bad things that took place, right? Because for some reason, negative events, bad events, seem to highlight themselves in our minds. Now, that's usually the pinpoint of our years. When we look back on our year, Oh, well, this happened. Oh, well, this happened. Oh, well, this happened. See, there's so much more that happened at Grace Church this past year. And if we only focused on the flood, <laughs> right? If we only focused on that one horrible event, and I remember sitting, oh, I remember that day clearly, that morning. I was so defeated. Oh, I was so defeated that morning. And I know that, that the elder Joseph pulled me aside and he said, Pastor, all things God has in store, all things God has planned. I was like, I understand that, but right now, oh, Elder Joseph, and he prayed for me, and I felt, you know, encouraged in that moment. I know that, I know that Elder Mark did the same thing. Elder Justin did the same thing. The deacons did the same thing. But in that moment, I was so focused on the tragedy that was partaking in front of me, right, that I couldn't see anything else. And a lot of times when we're looking back at our year in review, we can only pinpoint those dark spots, those, those points of negativity, those points of tragedies, those points of trials, of heartbreaks and challenges, rather than the blessings and the victories that happened and took place in our lives. See, it's so easy to look at the areas where we failed instead of the areas where we succeeded. See, but James 1.17 tells us this. James 1.17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good and perfect gift is from above. But you could be saying, but it doesn't seem that I'm getting very much in the way of good and perfect gifts this morning, Pastor. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, or 9, 8 says this. It says, and God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Listen, when we're talking about counting our blessings, what I'm really saying is this. Is that in order to do this successfully, we have to shift our focus. You have to shift your focus. We need to shift our perspective our focus to the things of God instead of the things of man, or even instead of the things that's in front of you in this moment. Shift your focus this morning. And I love what Pastor Vlad Sovchuk says it like this. He says, your focus is more important than your situation. So I ask you this morning, where is your focus? What are you focused on this morning? Is it placed on what happened? Or is it placed on what God did in it and through it to bring you out of it? Or the end result of it? Again, let's, let's harken back. Let's talk again about the flood that happened in, in, in June. It got us into the community. It got us actually seeking out and starting to pray for people who needed prayer. It got us out of the mentality of, well, God's going to bring them here. No, he's saying go out there. That is where I need you. So that is where he placed us in that moment, right? Amen. See, we can focus on the tragedy, but the outcome of it is greater than the tragedy in itself. 
Shift your focus on what God is doing. Shift your focus on what God did in those moments. See, some of us had dark points this last year, but what did God do at the end result of it? What is the end result of it? Right? Listen, Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 7, Paul gives us this amazing encouragement. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. See, Paul is sitting here, he's not saying rejoice in the Lord only when it's good. Right? And if you look at the life of Paul, it wasn't good often. Paul's life was mixed in tragedies, in heartbreaks, in betrayals. It was, he lived in that. Right? But he's telling us here, rejoice always. In all seasons, in all situations, rejoice. See, it says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God. See, there's a promise there. What happens to get the peace of God? What do you have to do? You have to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, by, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Meaning you come to God praising his name in the midst of your tragedies, praising his name in the midst of your trials, praising his name in the midst of the darkness. You praise his name. And when you come to him and praise his name with thanksgiving and gratitude in your heart, what happens? And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, we have to shift our focus. Shift away from what we are focused on to who Jesus Christ is. Amen. Amen. And those of you who are experiencing those times of frustration, those times of darkness, those times of things, shift your focus. Focus on who Jesus Christ is. Focus on thanksgiving before God, with prayer before God. Oh, Rejoice in the Lord always. Trust in Him. Give Him thanks and praise. Every good thing comes from Him. See, and we don't realize, but blessings fill our lives every day. You wake up. Some of us, that's a blessing. Right? Some of us, to get out of bed is a blessing. You wake up with breath in your lungs. Only by the power of God. Having the ability to know that God is for us, not against us, is a blessing. Being able to spend time with the Creator of all things, our Lord and our Savior, is a blessing. Being able to walk with Him and talk with Him, spending time in His Word, is a blessing. These are all blessings in our lives. And if you look back on your year with lenses focused on God instead of lenses focused on self, you will see the moments where God showed up. You will see the moments where he came through. You will see those moments where he was working in the midst of your situation. Look back with lens focused on God and count your blessings this morning. The second thing, in order to have a year in review, is to review your year. We'll talk about that. But it's to review your year. See, we not only have to take stock of God's blessings, but we also have to take stock of how we lived this past year, how we walked this past year. See, Paul said something in, in Philippians 3 that is very powerful. But Philippians 3, verses 12 through 14, it says this. It says, not that I have already obtained it, this goal of being Christ-like, or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I may take hold of that perfection for which G Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful statement that Paul gives us in that moment. Forgetting what is behind and reaching for what lies ahead. And as we look back on our year in review, or retrospectively look back on how we walked, there are three words that are very important that we have to consider. 
that when you're doing your self-review, these are the three words you have to look at. The first one is remember. Remember. The second word is forgive. And the third word is forget. Remember, forgive, and forget. See, the things about this type of review is that many people don't like to do this because it's painful. Right? It may open up some scars. It can open up some old wounds. And some of us don't want to remember. See, but we have to remember something very important. Is that when we start going back and looking at these situations, we don't do it by ourselves. And if you're trying to do it by yourself, you're doing it completely wrong. Right? We don't do these things. We don't go back into those painful moments by ourselves. We do it with Jesus Christ, who is, again, the Prince of Peace. Right? And you have to also remember something else. Is that he walks with us through those things, and he provides us the peace that we need in those moments and in those memories. The body of Christ also is called to help each other through the things that we have to remember at times. Galatians 6 2 tells us this Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. But bear one another's burdens. That means if Richard is going through something, he doesn't have to face it, nor should he have to face it by himself. He's got men who should come around him and surround him and walk with him through those times, right? We should never have to face things by ourselves, church. We should be the ones who rally around our wounded. We should be the ones who rally around and lift up our wounded ones, our wounded brothers and sisters. And if you are in this church and you have felt that we have not rallied around you, I ask that you forgive me. Because we should have been there for you if you were in that situation. Amen? Colossians 3 also tells us this. Colossians 3 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. That is how we should be with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And you should never face those remembrances by yourselves or struggling by yourselves. We are the ones who should rally around and surround our brothers and sisters who are going through these times. See, then comes the part that for some reason is the hardest at times, is forgive. We have to forgive those who have wronged us. We have to forgive those who have hurt us. We have to forgive those who sometimes we don't want to forgive, right? But pastor, you don't know what they did to me. I don't. I don't know what they did to you in some cases. I don't understand the depth of your hurt or the depth of your pain. I know that. But I do know what the Word of God says. And I do know specifically what Jesus said in this matter found in Matthew. Let's pull that up. For if you forgive others of their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, now keep in mind, this is talking about no, knowingly unforgiveness. This is talking about knowing you have ought with your brother and not forgiving, okay? This isn't one of those things where you don't know you have unforgiveness in your heart, and then Holy Spirit's like, hey, you've got unforgiveness. And you're like, oh, no, I've got to forgive, right? It's not talking about that. This is talking about, I know I have unforgiveness in my heart, okay? And Jesus, Jesus, right? This is not my interpretation of the Word of God. This is not even, this is not even something that Paul received from the Holy Spirit, nor any of the disciples. This is Jesus himself who says, but if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. See, when it comes to unforgiveness in our heart, this is a very serious matter that we have to deal with and we have to talk about. Is forgiveness 
is something that we do as believers in Christ because of our forgiveness that we received from Christ. Some of us didn't deserve forgiveness. I know I didn't deserve forgiveness. But yet Christ saw it in himself to forgive me my sins. And likewise, because of that, we need to forgive others their sins. Now, yes, it hurts. Man, it's painful to forgive sometimes. And sometimes you have to do it daily, right? Sometimes it's not a one-time thing. Sometimes you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you forgive and you forgive until one day you're going, I don't have to forgive anymore. I don't, I don't feel the need to forgive anymore because you finally released that person in that moment. Why do we do that? Because Christ continues to forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive us. We need to forgive as Christ forgave us. Jesus doesn't say there's any ex uh, exceptions to this rule. He didn't say, forgive on, 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 only, only in certain areas can you not forgive. No, that's not what he said. He said, forgive all their transgressions. Everything. Forgive. And something we have to remember is forgiveness isn't for the people that you forgive. Forgiveness is not for them. Forgiveness is for you. Because it releases you into freedom. It releases you out of bondage. It releases you out of the chains. It releases you into joy, into love. See, because when we hold on to unforgiveness, that opens up the doorway and the root of bitterness to take place in our hearts and in our lives. And when we walk in bitterness, you can't feel forgiveness. But to forgive brings us joy. I'm not talking about Joy Archibald, right? Although she will be there at the end of it again, she's going to give you a hug. Amen. <laughs> but it releases us into joy into freedom, into happiness, and into experiencing life. And then the last part of reviewing your life is we forget. We forget. Meaning, we no longer hold that offense against people. Because let me tell you, if you still hold an offense against somebody, and you say, oh, I forgave them. No, you haven't. If you are still holding that offense against them, you have not forgiven them. You're lying to yourself trying to justify your still hatred or anger towards that person is what you're doing. Okay? But if you're still holding something against them, you need to forgive them again. And some of you are getting a name in your head right now that you need to continue to forgive. Because you have not truly forgiven that person. Now, Forget does not mean that we allow those people or that person back into our life, okay? Forgiveness isn't an open doorway of freedom saying, yeah, come back, let's go back to where, no. Boundaries are very healthy in Christianity. You have to set boundaries, okay? Especially with people who have hurt you in the past. Especially with people who have damaged or have abused your trust in the past or who have done great things to harm you, those people you need to keep at a distance until they can earn their trust back into your life, right? Healthy boundaries are very biblical. Set boundaries on people. Just because you forgave them doesn't mean you have to get the same position they had before they, before they broke your trust, okay? You still have to walk at a distance with that person, okay? No, we set very healthy boundaries in our lives for people. But we have to forgive. Because we forgive just as Christ and God forgives us. Let's look at some of those examples of how God forgave you. Isaiah 43, 25. It says, I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. How powerful of a statement is that from God? Psalms 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. How powerful is that? Hallelujah. And then Hebrews chapter 10, 14 through 18 says this. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. 
And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness for the, of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. How powerful are those three verses right there? That he will blot out our transgressions. He will no longer remember our sins as far as the east is from the west. Meaning, there's no, those are never going to connect, right? Just, just, just in case you know, you can drive east all you want, and you'll never start going west. You're always going to be going east, okay? You'll run into oceans where you have to stop and maybe turn around and head west. And when it talks about God forgetting our sins, it's not that he truly forgets them, but it's that he chooses to forget them. He chooses to no longer hold us accountable for those things. And likewise, as we come into those situations where we are forgiving people, that is the same mindset that we have, is we choose to no longer hold them accountable for what we have already forgiven them of. Amen? I love how John Brevere says it. He says it like this. If you measure everything by what has happened in your past, you will never grow beyond it. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to continue walking with him. And the only way that is possible is if we forgive. And we forget those things. We forgive, we remember, we forgive, and we forget. No longer staying in the past, but striving ahead to the prize of Christ. And then number three. The third thing that we have to do, we're looking at our life in review, our year in review, is repent. Repent. See, and repentance is one of those topics that is always going to be present here at Grace Church. Because repentance is so integral into our walk with Christ. It is so impactful in our walk with who He is. And if you want to look at one thing that is constant from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it is the act of repentance. Moses talked about repentance. Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Hosea, Ma Micah, all of the prophets of the Old Testament said, repent. And then we get to the, the very last Old Testament prophet, who was John the Baptist, and what was his message that he brought? Repent. And then Jesus himself gets on the stage and says, repent. So if you're thinking the message of repentance ended then, you're wrong. Because repentance is one of the main stories of bringing us back into right standing with who Jesus Christ is and where he called us to be. Amen? A huge part of reviewing our past year is repentance. And I know that we've talked about repentance and we've talked about repenting, and we will continue to talk about this topic because it is so important to walking a life of repentance. Acts 2.38 tells us this. Acts 2.38 says, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But repent. And the thing that we have to understand about repentance, it is that it's not solely about us feeling bad about our sins or feeling bad that we got caught in our sin, right? We can't come at repentance like a child comes at getting in trouble. Because if a child gets caught, they're just going to be like, I'm sorry, because they got caught, right? They're not sorry they did what they did most of the time. They're just regretful that they got caught before they could finish or continue doing what they were doing, right? And a lot of times Christians come at it from the same mindset. We come at it, well, God, I am sorry because right now I just feel really bad for what I did. But I know that I'm going to do it again. That's not true repentance. That is abusing the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace he gives us. That's abuse of Christ, right? True repentance, though, is this. And I love that, how, how Brother Francis said it. He said, true repentance is being disgusted by what disgusts 
God, being disgusted by it. And that is true repentance. True repentance brings us into right standing before God, blameless and clean. True repentance brings change in your life. And if you did not change after your repentance, it was not true repentance. Because true repentance, true repentance always brings change. It always changes your life. It always changes your mind. Amen? But when we're looking at our year in review, the past year, this is where we need to rely on Holy Spirit. Because if we want to live a blameless life before God, we have to allow Holy Spirit to search our life. We have to allow Him to bring up the stuff that we really don't want to talk about. We have to allow Him to bring up that correction in our life, that conviction in our life. And when He brings something to the forefront, you deal with it. You repent of it. That doesn't mean you're not going to struggle sometimes. Sometimes you're going to continue struggling with that, but God has also given you the tools on how to combat that. He has given you self-control. Some of us just have a hard time practicing it. Amen? But you have it. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives. See, 1 John holds an amazing promise for us and for repentance. We're going to look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. It says, This is the message we have heard from Him and announce to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. What does that mean? mean. If we say that we have no fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, if you say you have fellowship with God, but yet you are knowingly sinning, walking in sin, right? What does Jesus say to those who cried out, God, did we not, did, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not heal the sick? Did we not do this? And what did he say? Away from you, away from me, you who practiced and walked lawlessness. If you practice and walk lawlessness, that means you are walking a life of sin, knowing you're sinning, knowing it's a sin that you're doing, but yet you're still doing it. And if you say you have fellowship with God, but you are knowingly sinning, you do not have fellowship with God. And that's what it says here. You lie. You are lying. And you are not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not his. But Pastor Wade, didn't he just say that, that if, if you say you have fellowship, but yet, but, but yet you're, you, you're, you're walking in darkness, you're sinning? Yeah, you're still going to fall. Right. But it's in how we react and how we fall. If you fall and you're knowingly falling, and you're saying, I'm going to do this again because it feels good, that's walking in darkness. But if you fall and you say, God, forgive me for this. I am so sorry. Help me not to do this again. That is that attitude. That is the attitude of repentance that you have to have. That is walking a heart and a lifestyle of repentance, is having that lifestyle of repentance that when you fall, you come back to his feet. You come back to his cross. You say, God, forgive me for this. I know I have sinned. Forgive me for this. Because that very next line, right? Very first nine. But if we confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful if we confess our sins. I love what the Word of God says that if there's any sick among you, have them come forward and have the elders anoint them with oil. Have them confess their sins and they will be healed. There's power in confession. There's power in coming before God or even coming before your brothers with God. Your brothers and sisters with God and saying, Father, forgive me. I have sinned. This is what my sin was. Forgive me for that. And I love that promise. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our, uh, <laughs> us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. But if we confess, see, there's power 
in running to the feet of Jesus. There's power running back to who he is, running back to the cross. See, and the amazing thing about it is, is we go back to be covered by the blood of Jesus, but we don't start our walk with him over. That's the power of repentance. Is you don't have to start clear at the beginning. You pick up your cross right where you fell and you continue walking. You continue going. But forgive and repent and help me turn away from this. Because we have to get back to understanding that we have to repent. Too many times in the pulpits around the world to, today, we're talking a message of acceptance instead of repentance. When we are never told to accept our sin, we're told time and time again to repent of our sin. And there's a lot of us, even here this morning, who need to get back into a lifestyle of repentance. We need to get back in walking in repentance again. We have to get back to doing those things again. Because if you're living for yourself, you have to repent. If you're serving a 90-minute Jesus, you have to get back to repentance. You have to repent. Amen? If you're, if you're spending your time on social media looking at those sexually explicit images, you need to repent. Well, pastor, I'm not acting on it. I don't care if you're acting on it. You're still sinning because the lust of your eyes is causing you to sin. Amen? But I didn't act on it. I don't care. If you're masturbating, you need to repent. If you're looking at those images, you need to repent. Amen? If you're walking in any sort of sin that goes contrary to the Word of God, you need to repent. If you're gossiping, you need to repent. If you're lying, if you're stealing, if you're creating a false image in your head of who Jesus is, you need to repent. All of these things. See, God is crawling out back for his people to come back into repentance. He wants us and he needs us to come back into repentance. If you're living a life for yourself, you need to repent. If you've placed your family before God, you need to repent. If you've placed your children before God, you need to repent. If you've placed your spouse before God, you need to repent. If you place your job, your workplace, your career, any of those things before God, you need to repent this morning. He is calling us back to a place of repentance. And you could say this morning, well, pastor, we have grace. We have the grace of God. You don't understand grace if that's your excuse. Grace does not give you the right to sin. Grace gives you the right to not sin and stand firm upon the Word of God and walk out a life of repentance. Yeah. So if you're saying, well, I have grace to do this, no, you don't. You're making up an excuse to, co to continue to sin because you like it too much. Yeah. And he is calling you to repent of those things, to get rid of those things. Anything that stands between me and God, you need to repent of. If you have placed anything there, repent of it. And stop using grace as a crutch to excuse your sin. Because he has called us to live a holy and blameless life before him. Yeah. Holy and blameless before him. Church. But pastor, we don't live under the law anymore. Oh my goodness, I hate that. <laughs> yeah, <come on. laughs> How many times are we going to continue to bring up excuses to continue to live in a life of sin? We can't use the Word of God to excuse our sin any longer. Because Jesus did not come to end the law, right? We all understand that, right? He came to fulfill the law, to complete the law. And even in, sometimes I would rather be living under the law. Because He made the restrictions on us even more so than the law did. What did He say? If you hate your brother, you have committed murder. Under the law, you actually had to commit murder, right? Right? But Jesus is saying, if you hate your brother, you have committed the murder. You have committed murder. If you look lustfully at something, you've already committed adultery, Jesus says. So the moment you look at those images on, on, on your computer, the moment you look at pornography, the moment you look at anything in that, it doesn't matter if you act it out. You've already committed the sin. Jesus says, if you look at that, you have sinned and you have committed adultery. And what does Jesus even say? Well, I, didn't, I have never murdered anybody, Pastor. It doesn't matter. What does Jesus say? He says, if you have broken one of these things, you have broken the entirety of the law. Right. God, church, 
Jesus doesn't mess around with our sin. He does not mess around with it. We have to stop messing around with it as well. He is calling us back to repentance. No more making excuses of justification, wanting to live how I want to live. Romans 1 says, or Romans 5 verse 1 says this. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. See, grace is not for us to live how we want to live. Grace is specifically so that we can live exactly how Christ has called us to live. That is the grace of God. Amen. That is what he says. And that's why I love when people say, I want to pray grace upon you. It's not, it's not so that we can continue to live. It's so that I can continue to walk with Jesus Christ in how he has called me to live. Amen. That is the purpose of grace. Grace is how we walk out this walk that we call our Christianity. Our position before God is a matter of His grace. We come into His presence because of His grace. And we stand in His presence because of His grace. That is what the purpose of grace. And repentance brings us into right standing with God so that we can experience His grace. Whew. I really wish my sweater was a jacket right now. Oh, repentance brings us into right standing with God. Now, does this mean you're going to live a perfect life? No. That's the one thing we have to understand, is that we are men, flawed in our sinful flesh. We wage war against our flesh every single day. Every single day, your flesh desires sin, but your soul, your spirit desires God. And that is a wrestling match that takes place every single day. Sometimes we fall. Sometimes we stumble. Sometimes we lose our step, right? But that does not mean we stay there. That means you repent. Father, forgive me for this. I have fallen again today. Help me in this. Give me your strength again. And if you continue to stumble in the same sins, gather people around you. See, that is one of the biggest lies of the enemy that he's ever told the church, is that when you sin, you are alone. When you sin, you are not alone. And if you have true brothers and sisters around you, our job is to surround you in the midst of that stumbling and help you not to do it again. Don't feel like you are alone in your sin. Don't feel like you are alone in your stumblings. You are not. You have brothers and sisters in this place who will surround you and pick you up and help you in the midst of that. But it takes you confessing that sin, confessing that struggle. But yes, you're going to stumble. That's why repentance is called a lifestyle of repentance. That is what sanctification means, the process of being saved. We're not, we don't reach our salvation until we're, until we're with him in heaven, until we're, until we're with Christ in glory. That is when our life of repentance ends when we're with Him in glory. But a lifestyle of repentance. In fact, if you want to live, well, who wants to live a holy life? Most, most of us do. Some of you aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I say, right? <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. I can say, how many of you believe Jesus Christ is Lord? And like five people, yeah! Everybody else is like, yeah! I don't want to, I can't get it up. It's, right? I can't raise my hand no matter what. That's okay. It's okay. But if you want to live a holy life, how do we get to live a holy life? You get closer to the source of holiness. If you want to live holy, you have to live with the one who is holy. And in fact, I love how Pastor Vlad said it, had said it in one of his messages. He said, when you go out to start a fire, you don't start a fire out of yourself, but you go to the source of the fire. And if you want to continue leave, living a life of being on fire for God, you don't start that source by yourself, but you get near to the source of the fire. 
If you want to live holy, if you want to live a life of repentance, if you want to live that life out, you have to get to the source. You have to live in the source of holiness. You have to live in the source of the fire. You have to live in the source of where our repentance comes from. You have to live that relationship out with Christ. But we're going to be talking about that next week, actually. I don't, want to, I don't want to dive into what we're talking about next week. But I want to end with this verse. Acts chapter 26. 26. It says, But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. This is Paul recounting what Jesus called him into. He says, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. To open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and have an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. If you want to know your purpose as a believer, it's exactly the same calling as Paul. To live your life in repentance so that we can have people's eyes opened and so that they may turn away from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan back to the dominion of God. That is what repentance does. Repentance opens our eyes again to what God has called us to do. Turns, or turns us away from the things of the flesh and focuses on the things of God. So this morning, we're going to take some time. I'm going to have Pastor Ali come back up. Brent as well. I like I like the I like the guitars. I know I heard a pastor say that the uh, the holiest of instruments was the piano. But we don't have a reference of a piano in the scriptures, so I'm going to use biblical instruments. I'm joking. I apologize. I apologize. But I want to give us time this morning to repent. To start out the year in review that you have. To take stock on what your year looked like. Because I can't preach that message, right, and just send you out without giving you an opportunity to react to some of the things that God is speaking to you even in this moment. And I know that God is speaking to some of you this morning. As you consider this past year, I'm going to ask that you ask Holy Spirit to search out your heart. To search your mind. Give Him the time to speak to you this morning. If he is saying to you this morning, I need you to repent for not placing me first. I need you to repent for that thing you did back in May. Repent of those things. Turn away from those things. Walk away from those things this morning. If you need to give forgiveness, give forgiveness. If you need to receive forgiveness, receive forgiveness this morning. And if those people are in this room this morning, give and get repentance or, or give and get re re uh, forgiveness now. 
don't wait for it. Don't say, well, now is not the time. What better time than now? If you need to come to the altar, come to the altar. Those of you who are watching online, we're going to go ahead and close our live stream at this time. But I encourage you to do that exact same thing in your homes. Repent. Give forgiveness. Review your year. 